you can hear me. So you can hear me, right? Okay. Uh, I'm actually not very good at using these. I normally use labels. So if I'm going out in and out, just let me know. Uh, uh, so uh, so I'm coming all the way from uh, Phoenix. Uh, I, I have to admit that this is not. I mean, I love coming to Taiwan, but this is not the easiest time to come because my we are all teaching, and, and in fact, there was a I had to make up an exam and give it to my students yesterday just so that I could be here. Um, there really are, I think, you know, two reasons why I came. Partly, first, one is uh, back in uh, 2012, I was in Taipei, and I have very fond memories. Uh, the Year of Dragon, I spent time in uh, Lantern Festival and all that stuff. And this lady blessed me in Longshan Temple. Uh, so um, things have been very good for me after that. Um, and then, of course, the second is I've known Jane for such a long time, and she's such a good friend that you know I had to uh, accept uh, her request. Uh, so I'm happy that I'm here. I've been enjoying um, uh, the beautiful city already, um, the, yesterday and today. Uh, so what I'm uh, going to talk about today, as I said, is synthesizing explainable behavior um, uh, in AI systems. Um, uh, where explainable, of course, means that AI systems are working with humans. Otherwise, why do you be providing explanation? Um, so I'll get there a little uh, uh, kind of roundabout way just to give you a good enough reason as to why we want to care about human in the systems, human in AI systems, and so on. Um, so I don't have to tell you that uh, AI has become way too big. Suddenly, um, in fact, I think uh, there's all sorts of crazy hype about AI. People are talking about AI being a new electricity. It's bigger than fire electricity. It's in fact God. Everything has AI in it, including your toothbrushes, apparently, have AI in it. I'm really worried about touching toothbrushes these days because of that. Um, on the other hand, of course, we also have the negative hype about AI. AI is bigger threat than after yeah, AI will start the second, third world war. AI yeah, will be the worst event in the history of civilization. Of course, it will destroy humans anyway. So basically, it's a great time to be in AI. So it's either complete one extreme or the other extreme. Um, so obviously, you know, we are all, most of us are like from academia, from universities. We are supposed to be the more sane ones who don't fall prey for these kinds of crazy hypes. So surprisingly, MIT already decided that they need to have a separate college for artificial intelligence. You know, forget about physics, it's just a department. We need a college for artificial intelligence. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is launching an undergraduate degree in AI. Uh, China has a high school AI textbook because it's too late to you know, mess around at, in the university level. And of course, India said, we're going to do this in the middle school level. Um, so we're going to do AI in the middle school. Now, clearly, you know where this is going, right? Essentially, all of these guys are way too little and way too late. So I and my colleagues at Arizona State University have come up with this new in utero AI program. So, so, so basically, you can have your kid come into this world fully equipped with the AI knowledge so that they can compete very well. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of, you know, hopefully if you have, um, you know, anybody who knows who has kids coming up, you know, make sure that they get in enrolled in this, you know, after uh, having this very big program. Anyway, um, so I'm not complaining too much because of the crazy of the work AI, yeah, we get to go around all over the places, you know, when else do you have uh, nerds on uh, TV suddenly uh, hanging around in the Roosevelt room, uh, hanging around, you know, um, in India. Um, so, and then of course, when else do I get called to come to your beautiful city? Um, so, this yesterday evening, I did go from the dragon and came out on the uh, you know, tiger, which, by the way, is the only right way to do. That converts apparently your bad luck into good luck, the other one, the opposite. So, don't do it. So, <laughs> okay. So, you know, I much of this, uh, you know, I, about AI, yeah, I sort of happened to have start around the time that I was the TPI president. And since presidents always take all the credit, I have decided that I have made AI great again. <laughs> okay, so more seriously, as much as there is hype about AI, 
the one, the kinds of uh, crazy uh, advertisements about AI, etc. that I'm giving look forward to are uh, these kinds of ones. Uh, AI helps old lady across the street, it plays with kids, cooks food, hangs around, stands, drama, no drama, just basically getting along with people. Um, you know, clearly this is uh, an ad that you probably haven't seen yet uh, because it's fake news, I guess. Really. Uh, okay, um, so the question is, why is it a fake news? Why exactly is it that for all our interest in AI systems, uh, we have basically not particularly cared about AI systems working with humans? So if you look at uh, the history of AI, AI had a pretty curious ambivalence to humans, okay? So most of our best systems are very far away from humans, like on Mars, where there are no humans, are, are on adversarial stance with humans. So we are either trying to clean them in chess, or in Go, or in poker, or in even the new um, you know, computer games and so on. So, you know, if you tell some uh, Joe on the road, the AI people are trying to make the world a better place, they say, oh, I believe, because all I hear about is that it's going to take over the world. Um, so, in some sense, AI systems have a kind of a mindset that uh, John Lennon used to talk about. Uh, he said, if you want to help humanity, if you want to help humanity, it's the people who really can't stand. Because unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, AI is done by engineers who can't get along with people, right? <laughs> I mean, if we can get along with people, we have been in sociology or something. So we basically are engineering and we can't get along with people, but we want to say we want to help people. Uh, anyway, so this issue of AI systems coming, working with humans, has always had a bit of a bad rap. People did not take that seriously for the longest time. So when I got my chance to provide, do the presentation address for AI in New Orleans uh, last year, I, I basically spoke about these challenges of human-aware AI systems. In particular, you know, this business about interpretability of AI, etc., that shall be coming that I'll talk about a little bit. It's just a small piece of a bigger puzzle. You want AI systems to get along with us. It's a, it's a thing that we are discovering. We are inventing a future. Why we invent a future when we have no place? It just makes no sense. Okay. Um, so basically, I talked about the challenges of uh, human AI systems. Why is it human AI all over the world is already? Why should we pursue it? Is it considered cheating if people are in the loop for the longest time in AI? If humans are in the loop, they would be worried that humans will actually be doing all the work. Which is not surprising if you remember the mechanical tuck, the original mechanical tuck had an actual tuck sitting inside this contraption, who was the brains. And so this is the way humans in the loop used to be for AI. So I want to argue that in fact that those days are over, that we actually have a lot more. We are not trying to use humans as a crutch. We want to, the AI system should get along with humans. And then, of course, I talked about a whole bunch of research challenges about this direction. Uh, actually, the paper on that is going to come out in the AI magazine uh, very soon. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I uh, try to argue there is, in a way, working with humans provides much larger set of um, research challenges for AI systems than just working by yourself, working by themselves. Okay, so this is not surprising to us because we do realize, you know, we the engineers, we do realize that it's kind of nice to work with other people, even though it's kind of painful for us. And in fact, you can, it's a more of a challenge, you know, in terms of actually interacting appropriately with humans. Uh, so, you know, the, there's this evolutionary theory which says that we have these ridiculously large brains compared to our evolutionary siblings which happens, it happens to be true. I know most of the time we are thinking that we have very bad brains, but we actually have very big brains. And they were not there to run away from the lions of the savanna and the tigers of Bengal. They, we develop them to be with each other. We are constantly modeling each other's mental states. We are using that to either cooperate or compete. Both are very important. And in fact, this is that important issue, mental modeling, that minds are being a crux of AI systems working with humans. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, there is a Salian test. How many of you have heard of Salian test? 
Okay, so let me tell you what Talia and Test is just so that you have a sense of what they're doing. Um, Talia and Test is given to little kids, and here's the, uh, here's the thing. So Sally comes in, uh, and then this is of course Anne. Sally comes in, puts a ball in this uh, yellow box, and then Sally goes out. You are all sitting there watching this, you know, ball. And then Anne comes in, takes the ball away from the yellow box, and puts it in the gray box. Okay, at this point, um, Sally comes into the room. And that's of course, Sally comes into the room. The question to you, this is pop quiz in the middle of the day. Which box do you think will Sally be looking into for the ball? Okay, those of you who are trying to desperately calculate using deep learning, you are in big trouble. Deep trouble, okay, <laughs> seriously. Um, for most of us, this is a silly question. We know what's going on. But believe it or not, kids, don't realize this. When kids are actually born, infants actually think the world is just a continuation of their body first. And they realize that in fact they're different after all. But then they still don't realize that they, what they know is not known to other people. And it's when they know that what they know is not known to other people, that's when they are able to actually start doing mental modeling. That's when they can actually lie. I don't know about you, there are enough people who seem to have kids here that were enough, that when my kids started telling lies, I was ecstatic. <laughs> because that means he has a brain, and it's actually working. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Being able to tell lies is actually a high form of intelligence. Integrity is not inability to tell lies. Integrity is knowing that you can tell lies, choosing not to. It is a very deliberative process. Okay. So the point, of course, is the AI systems have to have these mental models of the humans in the loop to be able to cooperate with them. And then just as what happened here, this in, in this scenario, um, you know, in, in real in, in the AI systems case too, that can be used for either cooperation or for competition. And in fact, towards the end, even though most of my talk is about uh, cooperation between the AI systems and, uh, and, and the humans, um, I also talk to you about how this same thing can be used to provide lies. Sometimes very white lies. Maybe you want your AI assistant to tell you a few flattering remarks. You know, you're really, you know, shaped up. You know, you've been really exercising, you're working out, you're great, etc. And sometimes that might be actually a useful thing for you. So in fact, we'll talk about how that also comes from the mental modeling, not surprisingly. Um, anyway, so keep that in mind. Uh, and again, if you, if none of this, this Sally and Tess, etc., may be too esoteric for the younger generation, uh, but I am assuming that people know Friends, uh, which is this uh, crazy uh, popular uh, uh, show sitcom. And there's this one uh, thing you should look up where uh, Rachel and uh, uh, Phoebe are talking about how to kind of strategize. And so they say, they don't know that we know that they know that we know. This is how we manipulate each other. That's why we need big brains, okay? Um, so in general, mental modeling is very much part of human-human uh, interaction. So it has to be part of human-machine interaction. So when I've been doing this, one of the things that I've started doing is basically, in addition to that uh, residual address, I've started pushing this whole direction in various places, and of course, lots of other people are also very much aware of the fact that we ultimately want AI systems to work with humans. So the partnership for AI, which is a big consortium of, uh, um, of, of companies as well as non-profit organizations. I was a, a founding uh, uh, board of directors member. So notice that they have one of their thema thematic pillars is collaboration between uh, people and AI systems. Um, and the other thing, of course, is all over, in, in US at any rate, most of the research programs wind up having human away AI as one of the big uh, directions, uh, at least partly connected to you know some of the things that we've been pushing. In fact, even the most recent, um, uh, the, the current administration came up with uh, eight strategies that they want to push, and number two is human AI collaboration. Not just interpretable AI, not debugging your program, which is what interpretable AI becomes. You want AI systems to work with lay people, not software engineers who wrote the machine learning system and have no idea what's going on. That's what has become the interpretable, uh, interpretable machine learning. But that's just a much smaller part of human AI systems. 
So in this talk, what I really want to do is what does it tell you, what does it take for an AI agent to show explainable behavior in the presence of human agents? In, you know, from my research, you know, much of what I done there was out of the setup, but I'm going to talk about my group's research. Um, and then if you want to remember just one thing, you know, this is the sound bites. Like obviously a professor's sound bite is also a long sound bite. Um, so it says that to synthesize explainable behavior, you need to go beyond sort of planning your behavior with your own models of your own uh, 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 models of the world, but take into account the mental models of the humans in the group. And then this mental model here is not just the goals and capabilities of the humans, that would be intentional recognition, but also you want to understand what does the human think of the AI system's capabilities. It turns out this second order regress actually winds up being extremely important for showing interpretable behavior and to provide explanations, as I will tell you um, during the talk. Uh, okay, um, so just to give you like an abstract idea, if you have uh, like a simple agent working in the world, you know, starting from a, 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 a given set of states, and I'm, by the way, from the planning community, so I tend to look at this problem from the uh, planning perspective, but many of the issues are actually connected to theoretical enforcement, and theoretical and deep departmentalism, they are all basically still connected. In fact, we're reading papers in those directions too. Um, so a yeah, single agent essentially will start with their state and then sort of come up with a, sort of a policy or a plan to reach the goals that it needs to go to. Um, the moment there is human in the loop, if the agent, the AI agent has an idea of what the human's model of the world is, it can use that to actually assist and get out of the way. That's the minimum. Okay. Um, so in fact, this is the kind of thing that people do. You want the robots to kind of provide you assistance and get out of the way uh, when, in fact, they should not be in the, in the way. Okay, that's like the minimum. The next level, of course, is the AI system has to realize that the humans are always modeling. Humans are going to model the AI system the same way they model other humans. Okay, so they have a sense of what they think are the robots' capabilities. Okay. Now the robot essentially, the AI agent, has to take that into consideration in deciding its own behavior. So one of the interesting things when you have other people in the loop is essentially you, what the behavior that you think is optimal for you may not be the one that people expect, expect from you at that point of time. Right now, for example, I feel like singing a Hindi song. But I won't because you don't expect me to sing a Hindi song right now. Okay, and so it may be inoptimal for me, but I change my behavior to take into account your understanding of what my current goals are and what my current capabilities. So that's basically what we're going to do. So in this MRA, it allows the agent to anticipate humans' expectations in order to either conform to those expectations. So don't do anything that surprises people. So for example, I won't sing a song right now. Okay. Uh, but imagine I have a, a huge bee biting me in the back of my neck right now. So I'm not supposed to jump up and down because you will be surprised why I'm jumping up and down. But if it's really biting me hard, I will start jumping up and down. Because it would be inexplicable behavior, but I will provide you an explanation. I will tell you the reason I'm doing this, the reason my behavior is not what you would consider optimal according to your model of my capabilities, is because you don't know what is being. And I give you that information, then you will be able to realize that actually what I'm doing is optimal. Okay, so that's the basic idea, and that's what we'll wind up formalizing. Okay, so the agenda for today, um, you know, depending on how uh, we get through, is basically I want to kind of give you this point that conforming to humans' expectations, that is what the explicable planning, that is essentially explicable behavior. So you just conform to people's expectations, you don't need to talk at all. Uh, and then if you, if in fact conforming to the expectations is too costly from your model, the AI agent's model, then it will essentially provide an explanation as to why its behavior still makes sense. The explanation then would be reconciling the two models, the human's model of the robot's capabilities versus the robot's own model. Okay, and so you're telling the human, so you assume that I have these capabilities, but in fact, you're wrong in the following sense. So explanations really, in my sense, is a model reconciliation. That means you're changing other people's mind about what your model of the world is. That's what an explanation really is, okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, it 
terms of once you understand these two, those are like the main things. Um, I want you to understand that these explicable and explanation really can be traded off. And in fact, you can, an agent can generate a behavior that includes some explanatory actions as well as some causative actions. Uh, those of you from our representation community would know this as epistemic planning. And it turns out epistemic planning has a bad rap because it can get into infinite degrees and so capacity. But the kind of things that, you know, some of the things that happen here is one, we only need one level for at least the capabilities that I'm interested in. And two, we do have pretty efficient planners that you can actually provide, um, you know, compile down epistemic planning, that part of planning into lots of um, And then I just sort of try to mention um, that if you are ever talking about humans, and you don't talk about actual human subject studies. And you know, in the US, this thing called the uh, IRBs, uh, Institutional Review Board. If anybody says, we are all for humans, and they don't know what IRB is, don't trust them. Because they're just assuming I'm human, so I should know humans. Okay. As I already told you, engineers saying they are human is somewhat a bit of an oxymoron to begin with. Okay, so we actually are supposed to provide systematic studies. There are areas like human factors, you know, human computer interaction, which have talked about how to set up carefully constructed human studies to check whether or not your are are right. So that's something that we do too. And then, you know, finally I'll say that we have a, you know, after work that we're talking about, if you understand this explicability and explanation and the fact that they can be combined, there are like 15, 20 different directions in which it can be expanded. And they're all published in other conferences, which I, AI, Amas, and so on. Okay, so that's basically what I'll try to get to. Um, the kinds of use cases that we use in our work um, are two, uh, basically. Essentially, it's AI system working with humans. That's what I'm thinking in terms of. Um, so of course, I would be thinking in terms of human-robot interaction. And most of my talk, I'll show you the videos of the human-robot interaction, because those are easier to easier on the eyes, you know, people like robots walking around. But the same issues will work if a human uh, is working with just a non-embodied AI system, like a decision support system. If a decision support system gives you suggestions that don't make any sense, and it doesn't have a sense of your model of, you know, what the, um, uh, the task is, then that's not going to be used for decision support system. So we wind up actually doing both, uh, both sorts of uh, um, Directions for our power. Okay, before I go power, I should show who actually does the work. You realize that professors don't do any work, uh, especially the students here. And in fact, you know, I have all these great students. Uh, and in fact, in particular, the guy in the middle, Padhagata, he has graduated, he's at IBM AI uh, research. And uh, uh, I will be talking about, uh, about his work, Sharad Shedran, who is still in PhD. Anagha, whose work actually I mentioned in the end, she's actually using the same ideas for deception and obfuscation because it's the same ideas. Once I model your mental state, I can use it for cooperation uh, competition. Um, and then of course, Shailik, who actually does the work on the, the, the unembodied, non-embodied AI systems working with humans. Uh, I should mention that uh, Pradhagat actually got like a uh, best dissertation award uh, runner-up uh, in the planning community. Okay. So coming back to the, uh, what I said I'll tell you, which is this explicability issue. Uh, so basically, we want the robot to be able to make a behavior that's not just optimal with respect to its model, but it is also optimal with respect to the human's model. Now, as we're going forward, actually, so let me, so basically, the robot class model might be different from the human's expectation of it which will lead it to come up with plans that the human will be surprised, the behaviors that are, that are surprising. So there are two options. One is actually showing the explicable behavior, the other is the explanation that I'll mention later. Um, now, going forward, I want to mention two things. One is, for all of these, when I say model, I mean, you have to talk about a language that you're using. You know, models can be in all sorts of languages. Uh, the specific one that I will be talking about in this talk is, um, I'm coming from planning community, which thinks in terms of actions with conditions and effects. So that's the models that I will be using here. But as I said, if you like something else different, you know, most of what I'm talking about will still be relevant. In fact, we have papers on atomic MDP models uh, doing this set of things. Um, okay, so in the case of explicability, basically what you're trying to do is that 
not only do you want a plan that is actually working, but yes, you should have a plan that works, that satisfies the goals it's trying to get, but it's as close to what the human expects it to do in that context as possible. Which essentially, to kind of put this in perspective, let me give you a little video. Uh, so here, actually, we have a sort of a pseudo setup of uh, a robot, um, and I'm you know, doing a search and rescue kind of a scenario. Uh, where the human is uh, human uh, is uh, off the loop, um, outside of the building, and uh, you know this was actually this particular thing happens to be our uh, fifth floor of our department, and so there's a map of this. Now this actually is a useful thing to understand here that in the beginning both the human and the robot have the same map, but since it's a search and rescue scenario, things have changed on the ground, and so as the robot actually looks at more things, it has different knowledge than the human has. And it may or may not have, you know, communicated that right away. Okay, so that's what leads to inexplicability in these cases. So in this particular case, what we're going to do is, uh, if this video works, um, what happens here is the shortest path happens to be this place where we just put it like a fake obstacle there. Imagine if it was a like a certain risk scenario, there's some bubble. So that particular path became impassable. So a human expects the robot to be taking that particular path. Now, if you want to be explicable, you have to essentially still take that path. You have to clean that rubble and take that path. That's pretty much what is expected. Imagine, in fact, there is a human end, you know, waiting on the other side to a rendezvous. You just take a different path, it doesn't help. Like yesterday, for example, my caution flight, flight got canceled and some other flight to maybe Hawaii is there, I can't just take it because you know, Jane would not ever talk to me again. Um, so, so basically, so you have, I, you wind up showing explicable behavior by essentially doing something that may actually be an optimal uh, for you. In this particular case, the robot had to do extra work in terms of cleaning up the robot. Okay, so that part, uh, now, the way that is to be done essentially in terms of planning uh, is you are trying to compute a policy um, such that you're taking the best policy who's, which basically minimizes this entire thing, the cost with respect to the robot itself, plus some regularization term, which is talking about the distance between what the plan that robot is speaking and what the human actually expects, expects it to be. So what you're trying to do then is to minimize this distance to some extent, in addition to actually having a valid plan that's not widely impossible. Okay. Uh, now it turns out that you can do it in two different ways. Um, if you happen to know the human's model directly, explicitly, you can actually connect, compare the distance metric. You can define distance metrics between plans. You know, given two plans, you can talk about the distances in terms of the actions or in terms of the causal things or whatever. And use that to actually do the explicable planning. Uh, there is a short paper like this year, even though this was an idea that we came up with four years back, it happened to actually see you know, for uh, this year. Uh, but then there is this other one which we will want to talk about, which is the robot doesn't have access to the human's expectation model. It doesn't have an explicit model of the human's expectations. But it might have a procedural understanding of what kinds of behaviors the human is kind of happy with and what kinds of behavior human are is providing such that say, you know, I'm not happy with this. So in essence, you can actually assume that there's a labeling procedure that you have, uh, and that using those labels, um, basically, you can then, uh, if you can learn that labeling procedure from the training data, then you can use that in um, as part of your search to essentially go towards plans that will likely be labeled as explicable by the humans. Okay? So here, instead of learning the actual model that the human has, I just learned the expectation directly. Okay? So that's a way in which you can uh, do this. In fact, we'll talk about this in a, a little later too, it's the same kind of an idea. And so this stuff actually got uh, published in April 2017. Um, so now, so you can think of this as essentially a model-free version of the explicability, the other one is a model-based version where you happen to have a model like it. Uh, now if I want to give the explanation, the idea in the, in the same example is this time the robot basically looks at the obstacle, says, ah, to help with it, I'm not going to lift the obstacle. I'm going to take what is the next best path for me. And then if I had actually connected the audio, you will be yelling, yelling saying, the path from P1 to P8 is blocked. That's its explanation. So it's not telling you everything in the 
uh, environment. It's just telling you the piece of the environment that makes a difference to the human's model. With that, the human will be able to figure out that this is actually the right. So that's the explanation. Um, so you can do the same kind of explanations. It turns out for you know, radiation support systems too. I, you know, we have papers, but I won't talk about it right now. Here. Yeah. Um, now, so basically, the explanation in this process, and I'll tell you in a minute how those explanations are computed. It involves actually a search in the space of models, which eventually are converted into something like an epistemic planning that is just coming up in QPI 20. But before I go there, I know that lots of people have heard of explainable AI. Not necessarily in terms of robot behavior, but much more in terms of interpretable machine learning. I want to kind of set you straight on the connections. Okay? Um, so, XAI is hot, and mostly it focuses on images sort of things, and then basically say, if you classified something this way, can you give me a reason why you classify it? Except the reasons are not real reasons, they are pointing explanations. Because there is really no common vocabulary between the human and the machine. The only thing that is there is the image and your pointing. I want you to understand that civilization was all about us going away from pointing. Pointing is like the most primitive form of explanation, which might work for images. And I don't know how many of you have ever asked, ever asked your friend, why do you think this is a cat? Can you explain why is this a cat? If you have, then you have much more you know, boring lives than most of us have. What we wind up asking people is, why did you take this flight? Why did you come yesterday instead of coming today? We basically ask questions on the behavior, not on images. Okay, but so be it. So there are images, and then you start showing this uh, pointing. So, for example, if there's an Alaskan husky, if you say Alaskan husky, and a machine, and you ask the machine, why do you think it's an Alaskan husky? It'll show a heat map. Uh, it's a funny thing to say because the heat map actually shows snow on the ground, and so because there is snow, it must be an Alaskan husky. Now we are thinking about it, but at least you've got an understanding. But notice that this is really for debugging the system. Nobody really is in, you know, trying to get an interaction going between human and AI. This is like a, a, a machine learning engineer trying to debug their system. Interpretable ML has become mostly debugged. Okay. Now, it's actually not really very good at that either because uh, if you know the uh, adversarial example situation, um, is you all know that this is full bars and I add certain amount of noise, the right kind of noise, then you get this, which most of you know, if you have spent time looking at this sort of stuff, is an obvious ostrich, right? Because most machinery systems can be made to think that this thing is an ostrich, even though you can't see an ostrich there. Now suppose I ask my system, can you point me uh, which part of this bus is the ostrich? Show me, no, just show me, okay? That tells you how primitive pointing based explanations are, okay? And in general, in fact, first of all, they don't even work here, and, but if they do work, if the pointing explanations work, in the case of a behavior, you need to point on the space-time too. I need to basically tell, here are all the, the video of my life, and say, because of the video of my life, as well as the videos of my life that didn't happen, I have to take this point. That's crazy. That's where we wound up actually having symbolic vocabulary for a shared vocabulary. So I want you to keep that in mind. But there are connections, and in particular, the kinds of explanations that we talk about have very good connections to um, what psychologists believe are the right kinds of explanations. Uh, humans give explanations to each other. They barely ever ask, why do you think this is a dog? You know, th those kind of humans are, you know, pretty straight dark. Uh, so, um, so, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the couple of things there is that uh, the explanation that we generate essentially will have these things like contrastive property. It actually provides why um, this behavior is done by the robot as against what the human expected it to do, and uh, it also has a minimality property. In fact, one of the ways explanation should not be given, but it's very easy to give, is if somebody ever asks you why did you do this, you say here, take my brain. Put it on your brain, then you will know exactly why I did what I did. True, right? Because if you had my brain, you would have done exactly what I did. But that's not an explanation. It's huge, in addition to the gore and blood involved in transferring brains, it's too much of the knowledge being transferred. It's unnecessary. You just need to do the piece of the knowledge that you needed to understand why this decision went this way. Okay? So the minimality property might be important. 
Okay. Um, as I said, the, the background engine for computing these kinds of explanation winds up being, in our case, a search in the space of models. And under each model, then there is actually planning going on. So this is a harder search. This is actually a meta search in the space of models with, at each point, actually figuring out the plans. And these, the points, the, the, the transitions in this search tree are the model changes. So in my case, it would be the kind of, I add a precondition, I removed a precondition, I add an effect, I removed an effect. Okay, so if I go from uh, MR, which is the robots model, to MRH, which is the human things, is the robots model. Then I can essentially either go from this side, from the human side, and find the first model, uh, first change model of the human, in which the robot's plan is already optimal. That would be the minimal complete explanation. Or you can go from the robot side and go as far as you can changing the model and with all these changes, the plan that you have is still optimal. Except after this point. After this point, it's no longer optimal. In which case, that winds up being the monotonic explanation. If you provide that kind of an explanation, you don't have to change the explanation after the fact. Okay? Um, having said this, even though there's a human here and a robot here, the search is being done completely by the robot. You know, in the human AI, you don't expect humans to, you don't expect to control humans. The only controllable variable in the human AI is the robots, or the AI systems. Okay? Since the entire search is being done by the AI system, it can either go this way or that way. Okay? Um, this is all in an H type 2017 uh, paper, uh, 2018 paper. Um, and then, it turns out that this search is actually hard, but you know there are all sorts of interesting clever heuristics that you can use to reduce this complexity. Now, the other thing I want to say is, even though I mentioned explicability and explanation as if they are like two completely different points in the spectrum, they really are in a continuum. And you can almost see this if you think of a, a model search uh, here, essentially. You can realize that I can actually get the human's model to come up to a different point than where MHR is. Instead of MRH, tell human enough changes such that their model now becomes this. At that point, be consistent with that. So you are explicable with respect to this model, not this. And to get the human to go from here to here, you give them an explanation, which is this you know, changes to the model. OK, um, this is the part that you can, uh, by the way, I'll put these slides up on the Twitter. Um, so it's great that people are taking pictures, but if you miss something, I'll put it on the Twitter. Uh, so this essentially also gets me to this point that in fact you can do this whole thing in one unified framework with the planning itself. In fact, this is something that's been done in the back of you know, good old days. You know, Gabe Perro and uh, these people used to talk about epistemic planning, but they were not actually building planners. They were thinking in terms of logical possibility of doing it. So in and in fact. If you consider the fact that you're only looking one level of regress, that means you're only considering robots, and the humans model of the robots capabilities. That's one le extra level of regress. You can then essentially write this as a planning problem where you have, in addition to actions that change the world, actions of speech acts which only change the mental model. So explanations are nothing but actions that don't have any change in the world, but it has a change on the human's mind. When I talk, I'm changing your mind, okay? And once I change your mind, then in a sense, I'm getting you to a different model to which I can be explained. So you can imagine now a robot essentially developing a self-describing behavior, which involves some number of explanatory actions in the beginning, followed by a set of causative actions, okay? And that is something that can actually be done, and it's very uh, uh, efficient, and it actually subsumes everything that I said earlier. That's going to come up in 2020. Um, one other thing that I sort of didn't mention in, in talking about this is if you come up with these explanations, which are these precondition differences, effect differences, how do you actually communicate them to the human? Um, we have focused on up, in, up to here on the inference aspects in terms of how to compute these differences, but we have, you know, on the side we've been looking at, of course, using things like natural language to actually have dialogue with the human. That's very obvious. But additionally, because of the time we are in, we can also use things like augmented reality and brain computer interfaces. 
And I say brain computer interfaces, you don't have to think neural link. You can think even the cheap ones that you know university people can buy. So for example, this one here, this guy is wearing a small emotive interface. With that, he's able to, without actually saying anything, um, he's able to say that he has a deep sound of the deep And the robot can avoid well, that that, uh, by making this plan. So this is something that is possible uh, in this kind of case. And so what this is allowing is essentially uh, intentional recognition for the robot has become easier without the human having to speak. The other aspect is that robot also can project its intentions. When you are interacting with people, you have to recognize what they are thinking about. You have to give them foreshadowing or where you are. Okay. For that, again, we use, for both of them, we mostly use language in the case of humans. But with the humans and AI systems, in addition to language, you can have other modalities, such as augmented reality and VCS. So in this case, we are using HoloLens to actually um, you know, project onto the same uh, uh, basically reality that the humans are looking at additional information about what pieces um, you know, that robot actually wants to have. So that's part of the that we can do. So there's actually a nice paper in IROS um, about that I, because of probably the timing, I, I won't show you, maybe I'll show you this uh, chart. So in this particular kind of case, essentially here the robot is essentially providing the explanatory actions of the kind I was talking about, except it's doing by the green arrows. And the green arrows are being put in the holographic, uh, and the hololens uh, visual. It doesn't have to say anything directly. Okay, uh, there is additional uh, stuff on execution also on top of that. Uh, one thing that I want to mention now is you're going to go to second order parts, you know, for the rest of the talk. You know, so you kind of want to sort of explicitly an explanation and the fact that they can be combined. But I want to start removing some of the assumptions I made in doing these things. Okay, one of course is why did we believe that humans have the inferential capability? to understand that if you make this change to the model, then my, my plan is actually the optimal plan. We know that even for the simple strips planning, it's a piece space complete problem to actually get an optimal plan. So why do you expect humans to actually do that kind of a computation? Okay. Um, so however, there's an easy way of getting away from it, which is actually what we do as teachers in the classes, which is, um, so in fact, well, in fact, teachers in the classes basically exploit this so that nobody asks a question. You talk for a long time and say, any questions? And people are so shell shocked, they have no questions for us. You see what I'm saying? So that's a way of basically not ask, letting you ask questions. But one of the ways you can actually deduce the requirements of inferential limitations, inferential uh, demands, is letting people ask, why not this behavior? If the human doesn't, uh, if the human basically says, why not this particular plan? Why didn't you do this plan? Then all I need to do is explain to the human why that plan is worse than the plan I came up with. It may still not be the case that my plan is the optimal one, but it's better than the one that they're doing. This is what's called the foil-based explanations. So the humans at least have to come up with foils. Okay? And the foils basically, once they give come to the foils, then they don't need to be inference on that, whether or not that particular behavior is optimal. This is something that you can do. Uh, in fact, in the paper in which guy 2018, where Sharad basically shows that this sort of thing is actually best viewed in terms of an abstraction of models, a hierarchy of models, and the question that people give, in fact, this happens in the classrooms, the kind of question that people ask tells you where their error is to some extent. So you can essentially, based on the question, you can localize the human's model and then use that to actually provide the reasoning as to why the robot's behavior is better than the behavior they're expecting. So that's something that can be done. Uh, actually, there's a nice video there, but I'll skip over that. Um, one other thing that we sort of, I mentioned once, but not too much, is where does the human's model come in? So I sort of talked about the fact that in some cases, you start with the same model, the human and the robot start with the same model, and then you still need explanations. That's what happened in the in the case of, uh, in the case of the uh, Abram Sajjali scenario case. Um, but in other cases, essentially, if you don't know the model, you can consider, for example, there may be uncertainty in the sense, in fact, the robot might think that the human might have one of many models. And that can be handled. Or you can actually learn the human model from background traces. If that is available, you can do that too. And we have done some of that too. And then finally, 
if there are, even when there are vocabulary differences between the human and robot models, you can still learn their expectations as a labeling procedure of the kind that I mentioned earlier on at the explicability case. And uh, I actually want to kind of show that to you. Uh, so I'll skip on the learning part, but essentially one of the things is that when you learn the models from traces, they will be correlational mostly because causal models are hard to come by. And when you know the domain, you typically have causal models. So in a weird sense, essentially planning people are focused on the causal side. Learned models will be correlational, and so in fact, this will sort of force us to be in the middle. Uh, and there are some advantages of that too. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that you can actually provide explanations without knowing the model to with respect to which you are reconciling. Instead, you only know this labeling procedure. So the idea that you wind up doing, uh, this is a paper, uh, this year's guy, what you wind up doing is you still allow the humans to kind of check whether or not a behavior is explicable to them, except you say, okay, I'm doing this, and here is a little explanatory action, that explanatory uh, assertion I'm mentioning. And does that make it more legit? And then you try these out, multiple different explanations, and based on this learning, you can actually wind up learning the semantics of the explanatory uh, 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 communications. So that's something that allows you to do model-free model reconciliation. You're trying to provide explanation to somebody without knowing fully explanatively what they model. That's something that's good. Um, and then I uh, want to uh, quickly go through these two. Um, human subject evaluations are important. As I said, you know, much of this actually I talk, talked about uh, complexity aspects of the, of the uh, system and so on. Uh, but really, you do have to have humans in the loop. I mean, human subject uh, evaluation. Uh, as a great case in point is the Tesla autopilot, okay? Which basically is, first of all, badly named. It calls itself autopilot. And they say autopilot is just an assistant. In what sense is an autopilot an assistant? And you, it will completely drive the car, but you should be always on the lookout. So no humans that I know of can go from zero to full attention under milliseconds. And that's how that poor guy got that, uh, that particular job. Okay, so if you don't actually work on humans, right now, you know, I guess Musk is using you guys, you know, whoever is rich enough to have Teslas, as he's getting guinea pigs. But in general, this idea is to actually try and see, uh, you know, whether or not these ideas make sense in the context of you know, uh, human factors. And we have done this sort of a thing. So in fact, there's a paper in, uh, one as an example, there's a paper in human robot interaction this year that sort of sets up the same kind of a scenario that I showed you, uh, except between two humans, one playing the role of robot, one playing the role of human. And they, we basically see what kind of explanations that they exchange. And we show that the kind of explanations they're exchanging are similar to the explanations that we compute. And furthermore, we also show that the explanations are needed less if you do explicable behavior, which is exactly what you know I mentioned earlier. Again, these things look very obvious, but the entire human factors is full of obvious ideas that don't work uh, when you actually work with the humans. And so this is what I'm doing with them. And the last thing I want to kind of give you a sense of is the basic setup I gave you can be extended in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, there's a, like a cottage industry of papers there. Uh, for example, you can support model reconciliation in non-PDL, uh, non-effect uh, key condition settings. Uh, there's a paper this year, each cat 2019, on how to do the same thing for uh, atomic models and mark correlation processes with rewards and you know, action models. Uh, you can do this, you can connect it to the other formulations of, so that's the MVP thing. You can connect it to the other formulations of interpretability that people in robotics have been looking at. I already mentioned the connection to the machine learning attitude. But there is in robotics, they looked at predictability, legibility, and there's a nice paper in ICAPS this year which sort of puts this whole landscape of different notions of interpretability in our common framework and can prove theorems as to when is predictability implying explicability and so on. So there is that work. Uh, furthermore, in fact, one of the things that we do in real world to stop talking is to design the world in such a way that we don't have to talk. So it becomes obvious just by the way the environment is designed what your actions are going to be. And so this becomes an issue of how do you design the environment such that it will automatically provide interpretability. 
This is only useful if, in fact, a particular kind of behavior is going to be done many, many, many times. And we actually look at you know, some other considerations in designing uh, environments like that. Um, and then I already told you about files and models at different levels of explanations. The other thing I want to mention is if you have multiple humans in the loop, you can still use these same kinds of ideas to provide tailored explanations to each of them without having to do too much of a work. You know, in terms of actually dealing with this as k times and all of you know. And the ideas they correspond to the paper in my captain uh, last year, they correspond to this issue of the minimal and the maximal model analog of the human models. And then sort of you can do explanation with respect to these minimal and maximal models. And they connect to, for those of you who have background in uh, behaviors and planning, uh, these connect to conformant explanations. Without knowing your explanations, I'm actually able to give you uh, your model I'm able to give you an explanation. Okay, so that's something that you know, I'm not going to go into details here, but you know, that can be done. So that's basically conformant explanations. And one of the things that allows you to do is do things like this, where, for example, we have a system where, for this NASA, we actually have a mission planning system with multiple humans, where the humans are actually doing the mission planning, and there's an AI system providing additional support. But then, in addition to having one single interface that is visible to both of them, it can provide differing explanations as well as differing um, you know, heads up to each other human separately because they both have very different models. So that's actually possible. Um, and the last thing that I want to uh, mention um, is essentially that once you start having mental models of the humans in the loop, you can use it to lie, you can use it to cheat, you can use it to do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and this should not be surprising. You know, all technology is dual use. Intelligence is the ultimate dual use technology. And if you actually know how to model you know, human mental models, then you can use that to cooperate with them, but you can also use it to manipulate them. Okay. Um, so we actually talked about, and so in fact, this is connected to this notion of trust in autonomy. You cannot have trust if the system doesn't even understand what your model of it is. But on the other hand, but to do that, the system has to have a sense of your mental model. So it's actually modeling your mental model, which also gives it the ability to manipulate you. So there's no other way around. So you're going to have new problems, and you have to actually have a sense of this. So in fact, as Jan Kessler, who is an anthropologist, says, the moment somebody thinks something is an assistant rather than a tool, they basically deal with it just like the way they deal with other humans. Because we have millions of years of evolutionary pressures on us. We don't know how to. We anthropomorphize everything just because that's how we have come into this world. Okay. Um, it becomes important. So this actually does bring a whole entire set of new ethical boundaries for you know, AI. Um, so that I actually can talk about. Um, I will go over that later. But um, the thing that I want to mention is uh, Anaga Swart, because it has a cute video. In this particular case, she uses the same ideas. But in one case, she is the robot essentially wants to make sure that Anaga knows what its actions are. So she ensures that Anaga is looking at the robot at the time it's actually doing that. In the other case, you do the same thing that you do to your friends. Hey, look that side, and then do something. Okay, which is basically the robot in this particular case gives it a, a it gives you know sort of changes, diverts her attention just so that the, it basically have the its behavior is obfuscated to the to the human being. So basically, this is the TPI paper uh, this year. And it's the same ideas, but you can use it in, in the other direction too. And to, add to and then the last thing I want to mention is, you have this model space search that I mentioned to you. Now, if the robot is a good boy, uh, a good girl, it will actually try to get human to its model. If it wants to tell a lie, it just makes up a model here, and then gets to there. That's it. As far as the technology is concerned, it does work fine. Okay, so we can produce lies with this. And so in fact, this is beautiful lies of omission and lies of commission both fall very naturally from the work that we are doing. Okay, and again, don't, don't try to talk me another way. If you want to model mental states of people to cooperate, you also open this door. There is no other way. Okay, so in fact, one of the issues then is we have to ask in that case societal impact. So in fact, 
we were interested in asking if there are any AI systems for telling white lies to humans. If your Alexa starts saying, man, you sound so good today, or man, your hair looks so good today, okay, which most of the time, if everybody ever says your hair looks good, they're lying, right? We know that. But we feel good because if somebody said some nice like yours. The question is, if Amazon stuff and Alexa, uh, uh, one of the assistants starts telling you these lies, do you, and you know that that capability exists, are you going to be happy with it? So we actually did a study um, and then published this in AI Ethics and Society, which by the way is a conference that I actually was instrumental in starting. Uh, um, with, it's, it's a collaboration between ACM and AI, and we basically started it back in uh, 2018, um, basically because you know, societal impacts of AI are like a huge thing, and people talking about these impacts oftentimes don't have any grounding in the technical side. And the technical people don't care about the impacts. And you need a place where people can be brought together in a scholarly way to have discussions, and that's one of those conferences. And so in fact, there's a paper on that that we presented here about what people say, uh, what people feel about being told white lies by the AI systems. Uh, of course, not surprisingly, the moment we wrote this paper, somebody picked it up and they said, oh my god, AI bots are lying, and the world is going to come to an end again, but in a different way. Honestly, I think the world is going to come to an end more likely this way than the way that people think of, which is super intelligence is going to blast us to smithereens. Because thermonuclear bombs exist. They can blast us all to smithereens right now. You don't need AI for them. Okay. In fact, doing you know competition without actually physical action is a high form of intelligence. I'm sure all cultures have played stories about this. And this is the kind of things that are going to be interesting. In terms of these assistive technologies that are going to be all over the place, there's Alexa, there are all these things. It's not that Mark Zuckerberg is out to get you. It's that Alexa might be out to get you. Okay. And it's not that it has its own uh, desires and intentions. It's just that telling that why it might make sense in terms of reducing you know, the computational effect. And so these are issues that wind up becoming important. In summary, I have tried to tell you that synthesizing experimental behaviors requires AI agent to reason, not only with its model of the task, but the human task model, as well as the human's model of the robot task model. That's the second level. And that can then lead to a whole bunch of um, extensions, and I talked to you about them. Um, there's going to be a tutorial on this at AAI uh, 2020, uh, in fact, with the uh, people that I mentioned that are also going to be part of that. And if you are there, you, know, you might want to you know, provide get an order for our uh, background on this. I ran a course, a, 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 simple, a, a seminar course uh, last year, um, and the readings for that course, not just from our group, but for everybody else who's working in these areas are available. So any of those sort of interested in this direction might look up uh, that particular um, our course syllabus and papers. And then finally, I want to say that, look, we started by saying, I think this is like a nice thing that we can do. You know, we'll have humans in the middle. And it's like a good thing. Everybody will be happy. You want to be happy, yes, it's going to be happy. And yet, I spent the last hour telling you, A, the computational difficulties in doing it, and B, all sorts of crazy things that will happen in terms of this kind of thing. So it looks as if the human area is bringing in a whole slew of additional challenges as well as problems. Is it worth it? But then I would say, um, you know, in fact, engineers would say, if only it weren't for the people, the whatever people, the world would be so much simpler. And this is what you know, engineers would say, but we are sort of engineers at heart. We too would almost be like that. But on the other hand, some of our best friends are humans. So we might want to work with them. We don't want our systems to work with them. And so we might want to do that. And again, I want to show you my group picture. Um, and thank you. Thank you.
So, so we have the two obvious ways. One is, in fact, the mental state itself is modeled in terms of the same um, action precondition effect model. Okay, that's the declarative part. But you can also take a projection of it in terms of these labeling procedures that you learn, wherein you don't have to have an explicit um, representation of the model and yet do things that would be uh, acceptable to them. Just because you kind of learned, in a sense, a procedural model of the human's expectation of it. So those are the two things that we use. Yes. Imagine that if the humans know the AI might be lying, then they might have different behavior again. So there will be some tension going back and forth. So how do you think? So first of all, here's one very important thing to understand that humans are like the most elastic entities. Okay. And in fact, if I started singing in the middle of my talk, you would be surprised. But then the next time if I gave a talk and I didn't sing, you would be surprised because you expected me to see. So you kind of, first you'll be surprised and you'll change your model. And so in, in general, to some extent, one way to understand this is the longitudinal aspect of this is an important question. You know, if you are actually inexplicable, people will sort of make allowances for you. Okay, unreasonable robots will basically, people will get out of the unreasonable robots. Um, in terms of lies, that what that basically brings up, of course, is this question of how much it affects the trust. Trust is a longitudinal aspect. It's not based on, so you can talk about how you can lose trust by, in the, what they say, right? The reputation requires a lifetime to build, and you can lose it in a day. And similarly, so the, the you by showing inexplicable behavior are providing explanations that don't make sense, you can make the humans and the lose, lose trust. Value. But on the other hand, telling lies could also affect that. And you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question as to um, whether, um, we actually can't buy that. We all know that humans, we all know that our friends don't tell us um, full truth. White lies are part of life. You know, if ever anybody asks, you know, how do I look, and you tell the truth, then you won't have friends, right? <laughs> so, so we understand that. And so the real question is, do you also want, um, will people will have the same expectations on uh, assistive technology? That's what that particular paper was. That's actually a quite interesting set of questions that we did um, on Amazon doctors and you know, it might be useful. One, last one. Stuff actually, the robot tried to drive the human's model towards MR, it can drive it towards M dash R, which is not actually a true model at all. Right. And, and that would be telling you. Yeah, so to some extent, what makes a difference, what's truth or not, is really how much you can observe and, and kind yes. of accept. Yes, so the, the whole okay. issue, yeah, yes, the, the connection about observability and also the connection, I mean, these things. At some level, the full request comes in. In fact, I don't know how many of you have seen Seinfeld, which is this whole show, and George Costanza says, remember, Jerry, it's not a lie if you believe it. Okay. <laughs> so, so if the robot had the wrong belief about its capabilities, it might be thinking it is telling you the truth, but yet it finds up being objectively false. And then if you can if the robot can deliberately change its behavior, beliefs, right? None of that we deal with right now. And that's the kind of thing that the full complexity of the human behavior is. So people can brainwash themselves into believing a lie and then tell other people, 
know, explanations based on those facts. And you know, that will get you the full-on epistemic uh, reasoning. And I'm hoping that for the kinds of simpler situations, you know, we talk about two extremes, right? One is very simple uh, human um, and the robot uh, in, in the search, let's uh, say, you are the of those things. On the other hand, I told you that extremes, you can also use this for lies. It's not that we looked at all the parts in the spectrum. And you know, some of these parts essentially do wind up having to deal with this uh, uh, the possibility that the robot decides to change its beliefs just to tell them. How many of you have seen the movie called Memento? OK, you should see the movie. It's all about this. Memento is this great movie where this guy has a transient memory. So every day when he wakes up, he forgets everything. Okay? And it's just a lovely, lovely movie by Christopher Nolan. I won't give it away, but one of the interesting things is this way you can, I mean, we not only kind of delude ourselves into believing falsities. In that movie, he doesn't even have to delude himself. Because tomorrow, you will only remember what is written on the wall. Nothing is in the head. And he still he plans. And it's a lovely, lovely movie. Makes you very worried about. <laughs> I think that the enemy eventually is the humans, right? I mean, I think people are worried about robots taking over, but in fact, most of the ethical issues, societal impacts right now, are the humans misusing AI technology. And that's just not changed. That's the same with electrical engineering technology, it's the same with mechanical engineering technology. It's also well, I think that's a very profound conclusion. And with that, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Rao again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, prepare a, a token of appreciation. OK, so we'll let uh, uh, Professor Hong present the token.